Hey, what's up you guys? I'm Dr. Sharma. And this is gonna be a video on how to read a chest x-ray. This is gonna be an introduction, so really pointing out normal anatomical findings that you should be able to point out as a physician or even a medical student when you're on any given rotation, including medicine and especially radiology. The reason I think this is really important is because I think every clinician should be able to point out at least some degree of the anatomy on the images that they're ordering, if not even start to think about some of the pathology that they could be seeing on x-rays. Now, of course, on normal conventional x-ray radiographs, a lot of the findings may be trying to look for fractures, dislocation in foreign objects. On the chest radiograph, there's just so much more to see, such as interstitial lung findings, consolidations, cardiomegaly, a whole host of even pretty simple pathologies that you can see with a simple radiograph of the chest. And if anything, it would just be cool to be able to really point out anatomical structures and really key findings on a radiograph that you wouldn't otherwise know about. So before we get started, get comfortable, sit back, and pull up the appropriate image that you want to interpret. Okay, so let's get started. Um, what I recommend is to use captions for this video, and you can do that by going to the bottom right in their settings and adding captions so that you can see in English as I go along, you can sort of read along with the words in case you don't know exactly what I'm talking about. For this introduction, I'm going to go over a few preliminary chest radiograph findings and some of the techniques in general before we actually go into the interpretation and diving into the subtleties of any radiograph. Initially, I was going to assume technical adequacy, but I figured it would be very important to go over that with you because I find that in a lot of the other, these other videos, they don't go over the technical adequacies that you should definitely know before interpreting a chest radiograph. So I'm going to go over some of that boring stuff. I will not belabor it, and I'm going to go over more of that in detail in my more advanced lecture, but this is going to be a little bit more of a preliminary. Actually, so technical adequacy means several different things, but it's extremely, extremely important and not really discussed in other videos. So, um, but what the hell does it mean? You know, what, what exactly are we talking about when we say technical adequacy? One is adequate inspiration. So you want to see the posterior ribs, which are going to be more horizontal or even angulating upward to some degree and then they start to angulate downward and that's the anterior rib that's pointing down towards your feet. You want to see about nine to 10 of them on the posterior aspect. The diaphragm is below that or at some level at this point. That is adequate inspiration or inhalation. Inadequate inspiration can lead to vascular crowding at the bottom of the lungs and it can make you mistaken something that's otherwise normal for, an, for something like a consolidation or something that's not right, some sort of pathology that isn't actually there. What is the exposure on the x-ray? So here you can see everything is just way lighter and it's not exposed enough, meaning that there aren't enough photons that are penetrating the patient's thorax, penetrating the patient's chest, through the chest and into the, into the detecting plate. Essentially underexposure leads to underpenetration. Previously we were able to see the thoracic vertebrae behind the heart posteriorly, now we are not able to see that. In addition to that, we can see the right hemidiaphragm. Again, I'll point out all of this anatomy soon, but we can't see that on the left. Technically, technically inadequate exposure of the chest. PA versus AP. If I were to give you both of these, you should be able to tell me which one's PA and AP. And uh, unfortunately, it's just kind of a little bit of cheating because this one's labeled. But what's the difference here? What do you guys see is the difference between the, the radiograph on the left and the radiograph on the right? And if you were to say that th this heart kind of looks fuzzy and slightly bigger, AP radiograph, the heart is magnified because it is further away from the, the detecting plate. I will explain this more in my more in-depth video. The other thing you want to think about is a rotational component. So you want to have the medial aspects of the clavicles at equidistance with the mid-thoracic spinous processes. Those are right here. These are the circles. These are the thoracic vertebrae, which we'll talk about later and the medial aspects of the clavicles are equidistant. In this case, they are not. You can see that this clavicle is further away. And in fact, the medial aspect of this clavicle is actually overlying the spinous process and therefore this patient is rotated to the left. You can also see that we can mistakenly see some tracheal alleviation or shift of the mediastinum this way. Also, we're getting obscuration of this hemidiaphragm, which is not good. We cannot see the entire left lower lung. Additionally, the direction of the x-ray beam is also important. This would be an example of lordotic or semi-recumbent view on the bottom. You see that the medial aspects of the clavicles are now projecting at or above the first posterior ribs, which is not ideal unless you're trying to specifically look at the lung apices, but on a regular PA film, on a proper film, we want it the direction of the x-ray beam directly at the patient 
in a posterior anterior fashion, and therefore the clavicles will now line up with the posterior around the third posterior ribs. Now that we've talked about technical adequacy, let's talk about different densities. The density of air is the lowest and therefore it shows up black on an x-ray film, such as within the lungs, it's the blackest most part of the x-ray film besides the outer portion, which is straight air. There's nothing that's attenuating or blocking the x-ray films from getting to the collection plate. The next highest density is fat, this is a really good example of pericardial fat, which has its own shade of gray. Next, we have fluid and soft tissue, such as muscle, and a prime example of this is the heart. You cannot easily differentiate soft tissue with fluid on a radiograph, which is why we do upright and semi-recumbents when we want to see fluid levels. Therefore, we know it's fluid because it'll have a flat line to it. Next highest density on our radiograph is going to be calcium or bones, which is our osseous structures, such as these ribs and we will go ahead and start talking about how to count them. We did talk about the inspirational component of counting the posterior ribs and wanting proper and adequate inspiration on our radiograph. The highest density that you're gonna see on a conventional radiograph is gonna be metal, and in this case, we have an example of an implantable cardioverter defibrillator with a lead going into the, can you tell me what this is projecting over? That's the right ventricle. This lead has its own radio density, and it's projecting over. We can only say that it overlays the left subclavian, the SVC, going past the right atrium, going into the right ventricle. I'm gonna talk about my eye search more in a different video, but I wanna just tell you preliminarily what it includes. Remember that there is no one absolute style of eye search that you have to follow. You can kind of create your own, but typically, attendings and most radiologists that I work with have their own eye search and everyone's sort of different. The way that I like to do it is that I like to start with my vegetables and then work to my meat or dessert. That's because everybody will always get to dessert. Not everybody will finish their vegetables first. That means that you will miss things. You will miss certain parts of an x-ray and that's not the idea. The idea of an eye search is that you've created a way and a memorized way to focus on a radiograph and remember to hit every single part of the radiograph because you're responsible for every part. So what I do for my eye search is that I start from the outside subcutaneous tissue, make sure I don't lose, miss any soft tissue masses up here or anywhere in the soft tissues that has happened. And I also look at my osseous structures, such as the clavicles, make sure they have their good S shape. Look at my humeral heads and make sure they're overlying the glenoid fossa appropriately on each side. And look at my scapular silhouette. And finally, I look at my ribs and do my proper count for inspiration, making sure that it's an adequate film. And then I look at the diaphragm for any air under the diaphragm. Those are my vegetables. And then we start to get to the meat that everybody's going to get to whenever you put a radiograph in front of mostly anyone who's really untrained in radiology, they're gonna be looking at these structures and really point pitting out, getting their head really focused on these little details and they, they miss the bigger picture and they're missing their vegetables, they're getting right to the meat. So I really like this structure of going through a radiograph, but we're gonna start with A, which is airways. What is the structure that is pointed out here? That's the trachea. What is the structure that is pointed out here? That is the left and right main bronchus and the carina, which is the branch point of the trachea. You want to make sure the trachea is midline and you want to make sure the carina angulation is not more than 100 degrees. B is for breathing. Pointed out here is the right and left lungs. Make sure that it is well aerated without any focal consolidations. Make sure to be looking at the lung apices bilaterally. Every field of the right lung, including the right upper lung, the right middle lung, as well as the right lower lung, and the left lung. Ensure that you have crisp costophrenic angles here, which you guys know you can see pleural effusions or sometimes blunting of the costophrenic angle, and we'll talk about the differential for that. In this case, the costophrenic angles are crisp and well aerated. Ensure that there are no masses in the APCs like we talked about. Next in breathing, you look at the right and left hemidiaphragms, which is this line here. This is outlining the diaphragm on the right side, and then outlining the diaphragm on the left side, and you have to know that you have to be able to see the entire left hemidiaphragm, even below the heart. The heart should not be obscuring this. If this is obscured, that means there's a focal consolidation in the retrocardiac space within the left lower lung. Check for any unilateral diaphragmatic elevation. You'll be able to notice this because it'll be more elevated than one of the other sides. Diaphragmatic flattening is associated with emphysematous disease, and you will also see this with hyperexpansion of the lungs. And we also talked about the obscured left hemidiaphragm, which can indicate a retrocardiac disease. C is for circulation and the structure that I've outlined here. What is it? That's the heart. This is the cardiac silhouette. You have to ensure that the heart is at midline and in proper position, that it is normal in size, what, how you do this is measure the heart in the widest part of the thorax. You have to ensure that it's 50%. Are the heart borders well-defined or are they obscured? In this case, these are well-defined and crisp, as we can see here. Left heart border obscuration is caused by a retrocardiac consolidation, as we were talking about, which may also obscure the left hemidiaphragm. What structure have I outlined here? This is the right atrium. Check for any right atrial prominence, where you'll see this shadow protruding out this way. 
What structure is in red and what structure is in purple? The red structure is the left atrial appendage and the purple is the left ventricle. The structure here outlined is the aortic knob. And what are these structures that are coming off and tapering off here? The majority of what you will essentially be able to see within the lungs. These are the right and left main pulmonary arteries. So this is the left main pulmonary artery within the hilum as well as the right main pulmonary artery branching off very soon after, after being branched off the main pulmonary artery into its bronchiolar branches. What we check for here is any prominence of these central pulmonary vasculature. In this case, they are sized pretty well and they're tapering off and getting smaller as you go out into the lung parenchyma. You may be wondering what most of these structures are and whatever this, these linings are that we see within the lungs. The majority of what you see in the normal lung field is vasculature. This is all tapering vasculature off of the main pulmonary trunk, off of the right and left pulmonary arteries. And then when you see these circles that are also with a very similar density, those are overlaying vessels that are going out towards you or into the page. Another thing that you need to check for is any cephalization of the vasculature, which means that the upper vasculature, the upper vessels become bigger. This is a sign of fluid overload and or heart failure. Next on my list that I like to do it is everything else. We're gonna revisit the bones here, making sure that the left and right humeral heads are overlaying to some degree the glenoid fossa, and you can definitely miss fractures here. Remember that you have to look at everything that's on your page. Ensure that you look for any surgical neck fractures or dislocation. The right and left clavicles are supposed to have a nice S shape to them when you direct the x-ray beams nicely poster, posterior or anteriorly. Ensure that you don't miss any fracture of the clavicle. Next, I like to count the ribs. I start with the first rib, second, third rib, and I go back and forth, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. Here's the tenth posterior rib coming anteriorly. Ensure that you are looking for, during this eye search, any fracture deformity of the ribs. The vertebrae, as we mentioned, you have to be able to see the thoracic vertebrae behind the heart for proper penetration and proper exposure. And here we can see a vertebrae. Here's the spinous process projecting within the midline, as well as the pedicles bilaterally here, as I've outlined on this example, and the vertebrae itself. Checking for any rotational component, like the adequacy, and compression deformities, which you can actually be able to see on a frontal radiograph. Compression deformities involve decreased vertebral height and therefore you will see these edges closer together. Next we have the scapular shadows which can sometimes really trip people up into thinking that there's a pneumothorax because you see this shadow back here for example there but you definitely do see the vasculature going all the way to the lung edges and therefore this is not a pneumothorax. This is just the scapular edge, its own silhouette that's being projected onto the lungs. Next, looking at all the soft tissue structures, making sure there's no masses or any subcutaneous air, which would be, remember that air is really dark and you would see air under here. That can also hint towards a rib fracture. Additionally, looking for any air that is underneath the diaphragm, which would suggest any intraperitoneal bowel rupture. Remember that you can only well diagnose and assess intraperitoneal air on a upright projection radiograph because air rises to the top and therefore you need to have the patient upright in order for you to properly assess for intraperitoneal air. On the next video we're going to talk about everything. We're going to talk about pathologies and do a side-by-side -side comparison with normal and review this video before we move on to the next video in order to really get down your anatomy and the normal eye search.